ko tēnei tauhau, taui tēnei te mihi. So just a warm welcome back, um, councillors, uh, staff, um, and our guests online. Um, a warm welcome for our first regional council meeting of 2023. Um um uh, Piri, would you please open our hui today? Tēnā koe te Pagataka te hau ki te uru, pagataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tai. E hi a ke ana te atakura, e teo, e huka, e hauku, ti ei mau i ora. Tēnā tātou. Tēnā um, We have apologies from Councillor Williams and Tanya Hopmans, but I'm happy to move in. Will, you're happy to second. All those agree, say aye. 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 Those against, carried. Thank you very much. Uh, notices. Are there any notices for today's meeting? There are none. Um, and a bit of housekeeping, if you don't know already. Um, in the event of an earthquake, drop, cover and hold, uh, exit, uh, the nearest exit signs and meet on the grass area on Dalton Street. Um, in term, in, oh no, sorry, that is for fire. If it is an earthquake, <laughs> we will head up Dalton Street that way, up to Tiffin Park um, and up to the hill. Um, in terms of today's meeting, are there any conflict of interest declarations? Fantastic, there are none. Uh, we have the confirmation of minutes for the Regional Council on the 30th of November and 14th of December. Are there any amendments to be made to those meeting minutes? Kapai, there are none. Councillor Van Bake, would you like to move those? I move. Second. Uh, Councillor Lambert. Aye. All those who agree say aye. 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 Those against, carried. Thank you. Call for minor items not on the agenda. There are no minor items. Um, and it's it's not a minor item, um, but it is our time to acknowledge um, James at the end of this meeting, uh, which we will all get to contribute to the wonderful things that we know about you, James, uh, for the sake of it being uh, his last formal council meeting and in the public eye. So we'll wait for that in the minor item section. Uh, so we... Now move on to our decision items. Uh, the first being the Climate Action Joint Committee Terms of Reference. Thank so, you, Chair. We have Desiree yeah. and Pippa here uh, who will come to the front of the room and present on the paper. Kia ora kōrua. <coughs> Uh, kia ora councillors, um, so you'll see in the cover paper um, we are proposing um, a terms of reference um, following on from the decision uh, in principle to establish uh, the joint committee made by this council back in November. Um, I'll largely take the paper as read and taking questions. Questions? Councillor Harding. Thank you. Uh, look, just acknowledge all the great work that's gone into getting us where we are and have had already had a chance to, to have some input into the terms of reference and I'm the draft terms of reference and I'm largely happy with them. Just a question of process and, and understanding. We're on a fairly tight timetable to get this joint committee up and running and there's already been a bit of slippage and that's understanding, understandable. Just wanting to understand whether the joint committee is dependent on foot or commitment from all participating councils and and also uh, Tangata Whenua members or whether there is some ability to carry on even if we may get everyone on the waka immediately. Thanks. I might defer to Leanne for that, but my understanding is that you need all partner councils to... Uh, um, agree to the terms of reference via a council meeting before the first meeting. OK, so just, yep, I, I anticipated that that would probably be the answer. In terms of Tangata Whenua, uh, 
do we, can we make some progress if there is some slippage around the identification of, um, of the appropriate representatives? Because at the moment the presumption is that both the committees, the, both the RPC and the uh, Māori committee will magically on the day that they meet come to a decision and that, that might be optimistic. Uh, can, can you answer that? Uh, uh, is, is the process dependent also on, on waiting? Must we wait for the RPC and, and Māori Committee to choose representatives or not? No, no, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Ah, Councillor Sears. Thank you. Through you, Chair, just clarification, really. These terms of reference will go to the other two councils. They may make some small amendments or some changes or make some suggestions. It'll come back to us to finalise. Is that what's expected? Or is it only as it's written? They'll need to accept them as they are? Or uh, So my understanding is that it would go to all four other councils, so Napier, Hastings, Central Hawks Bay and Wairua. Sorry. Um, and um, they, if, if, if it was a significant change, then we would bring it back. If it was a minor tweak, we would um, perhaps we could insert a recommendation that says something like that, that if there is a minor change, that um, you delegate authority for us to um, bring that back to the joint committee. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, um, Chair. I'm just thinking there may be a few things we've missed from those councils' points of view that they may wish to... Yeah. Add, so I'd be supportive of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, because this is the first uh, round of terms of reference, and so it is still in draft form, um, and what we're asked today is to um, endorse the draft form to take to the other councils. Um, and they're very aware that um, they have an opportunity to make uh, changes to the terms of reference, as they should be in a, being a part of being a uh, participant um, in this joint committee. Um, so it will be an evolving terms of reference until we get to a point where there's consensus <coughs> with the other councils. James. Chair, just uh, further to that, uh, we've placed the item on the agenda for the Hawke's Bay Leaders Forum meeting next Monday so we can have some further discussion with the other councils on this draft terms of reference and we'll be taking to them uh, uh, what was presented to you today, either with whatever decision you, you make today to adopt it or to let it lie on the table or, or otherwise. What we're trying to avoid, which is inherent in the setup of joint committees, is a sort of a never ending process whereby yeah. everybody amends the same terms of reference and it has to come back round to be adopted and adopted and adopted. So, what we're suggesting <coughs> is that the, the draft in its current form uh, be adopted for now and then the committee at its first meeting could uh, agree between all of the participants at the table on a set of amendments and they would then come back through in one process just to ensure that that happens as um, efficiently and expeditiously as possible. Council Curtin. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. I just want to um, um, can ask the Council to consider, um, in addition to the objectives, if we go to the terms of reference, um, we've got a purpose to um, promote action to mitigate climate change, and yet the objectives 3.1 to 3.4 uh, talk about um, a planning um, uh, assessment, um, <coughs> and um, so so that's more um, the background development of of plans. But um, uh, I wonder whether we 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 are quite clear and explicit. Uh, in uh, the committee's purpose um, through its objectives being also, and I'm suggesting this this um, addition, a, a 3.5 to the objectives, um, to the to, to wording to this effect, and Leanne, I've given Leanne some of those words, um, words to the effect that facilitate collaboration uh, and monitor uh, or provide oversight of the delivery of increased levels of service for key infrastructure impacted by climate change uh, on respective councils. Um, so words to those effect to give to to in in, in a sense give uh, give um, uh, the purpose. It's, um, uh, it's sorry to provide an objective that is clear to everyone. It's this this is an action committee uh, looking to do things. 
um, beyond just planning. Thank you, Councillor. Um, and I, I suppose that's a um, inclusion, and we can um, add that to uh, <coughs> the the motion is an is an inclusion to the terms of reference. So that's what you're asking. Yes, for. I'm seeking support for that. Thank you, Chair. Um, before we move on from that, do we have any comment around that inclusion? Uh, yes, Councillor Harding. Thank you, Chair. Look, I'm just happy to endorse Councillor Curtin's suggestion. I think the value of, you know, I think that idea that, that he's proposing is actually embedded in, uh, I think it's in, in 3.4 anyway. It could be inferred in there, but I think it's help, helpful to make that, that explicit. I don't think there's, there's any harm in, in, mm -hmm. in highlighting the resilience of infrastructure. I think it, it probably adds. And, mm -hmm. and it, it also provides a good opportunity to test Mm. The uh, the appetite for the um, partner councils mm -hmm. on that point, so I definitely support that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comment around that inclusion? Right, but before we move on to the motion, are there any other questions regarding the terms of reference or the process going forward? Councillor Lambert. Just, just more query, I guess. Uh, um, in the objects they talk about, um, you know, Development of spatial plans and other things. Is there um, no, no thought of the, um, the Coastal Hazards Committee having any interaction here or mm. them interacting with that? Desiree? Uh, so there's definitely at the TAG level, there's staff that sit on both the TAG for the uh, Coastal Hazards and, this, and the intention is to be for the Transport Committee as well. And at the governance level, um, yeah, we definitely want to align the work programs of all relevant joint committees. So I think we make mention of we had thought about actually beefing that up. What, where was that from? That's in the um, it's in the cover paper, I think, on, on relationships or linkages. Yeah, there is definitely intent to align the work programs of all the, the relevant joint committees without duplicating effort. But yeah, thank you. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, yes. Sorry, Madam Chair, just yes. a, uh, another um, potential clarification, and it's to do with um, uh, Section 14 of the, of the Terms of Reference. Um, and I wonder whether it's worth adding, um, perhaps at 14.2, um, that the committee uh, may invite, um, and I'm suggesting that uh, the local councillor for that for that, uh, in relation to that uh, local authority, uh, is, is invited to attend and participate in a discussion affecting that um, uh, the, the area of their their constituency. So, uh, by that I mean, if, for example, um, it's a it's a relation it relates to a matter to do with the wire or district council area, uh, that the regional councillor, in this case, uh, directly would be on there anyway, but. Um, or, or Central Hawke's Bay, etc. So uh, making reference to inviting um, the local um, constituency member uh, to that part of the discussion. Um, can I ask Leanne, in terms of governance, how that would work in the terms of reference, so we're talking about membership, um, how you'd have a flexible alternate depending on uh, the gender of the day for that joint committee? As far as I'm aware, if you're not a member, you can still be allowed to have speaking rights, um, but you just wouldn't be voting on anything, and you wouldn't necessarily need to be a member of the um, joint committee in order to be allowed to speak. Um, one of the ways of doing that is um, suspending the relative um, standing order for that part of the meeting to allow that to happen, and that mm -hmm. would... Um, that way you wouldn't have to um, point everybody as alternates and then just come along to the one that you were interested in. Um, it would also be highly dependent on um, the people uh, setting up the agenda to make sure that... Um, if there was a, an area-specific 
topic for discussion, that that person was invited along to the to the meeting. Okay. Yeah. Does that attend to your question? Sure, yeah, it's, <coughs> yeah, essentially mm -hmm. um, making sure that um, there's that local representation is present mm -hmm. during that, that specific uh, discussion. Uh, whether whether it's uh, I'd, uh, the, the issues around a, uh, a return it sort of um, can be subvented by by simply making a comment uh, mm. that the committee may from time to time invite some words to that effect. Mm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can I clarify? Are you referring to um, people on uh, members of this council with local responsibilities, or also the TAs, like the Ahere member? Well, it basis? could it could work both ways. Um, obviously, I had in mind our own regional councillor representative being being present. But equally, when you think about it, mm -hmm. any interested um, um, local local authority councillors may it's may be invited mm -hmm. as well. So it's um, yeah. um, certainly a, an inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, proposition as opposed to exclusive? Um, I think in terms of keeping the membership simple but addressing the want for inclusion, um, the inviting, so there's, there's a logistic, logistical task there to be had to invite the right local councillor from the HBRC to, to those meetings. So um, it, it has always been an, um, an invitation for any of our councillors to come to any of our meetings. Um, so without disrupting the terms of reference, are you okay that they stay as they are and an invitation be sent out to the meetings? Uh, well, it, either way, is yeah. I'm neither here nor there. What I'm suggesting is if we put a gen general statement in, it makes it clear that, um, that that's, um, that's a desire of the, of the process. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, um, wouldn't the uh, management of this particular um, um, group and the staff send out agenda and additional papers to all elected members anyway? Leanne. So therefore, if there is something that is specifically that I feel I need to attend to, mm -hmm. what's on the agenda... I have an open invite, yep. so I think it's for transparency. Uh, it would be really good to have that for this particular joint committee. Thank you. That's a good suggestion, Councillor Harding. Uh, Chair, I just uh, I, I think Councillor Curtin's point about making sure that local elected members are on top of what's going on is really really valid. Mm -hmm. I think for the terms of uh, in terms of the t in terms of reference, and and the focus of this group is largely on regional issues, so. The starting presumption and the start of their work is, it, is at a high level across the region, um, and so <coughs> it's not practical to invite you know every elected member to, to every meeting. So there's going to be this, so the fact that we that all these um, all the, the agendas and, and, and uh, brief papers will be circulated widely is good. I think that, you know the, the, the such as who's ever operating the secretariat of that needs to be uh, alert to. The need where there are, you know, whether we are descending to specific issues in, in sub-regions to, to make sure that we're very inclusive about doing that. So I mm -hmm. propose that we wouldn't change terms of reference mm -hmm. at, uh, for this particular point, mm -hmm. but we definitely take it on board in terms of operation. Any other questions or comments in terms of terms of reference? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, just sure. um, just on. Uh, Provide some commentary, or, or rather, just a query around. Um, this is based around three meetings. Are we assuming there's three meetings per, per, per annum? Um, and I guess the live streaming or, or recorded live streaming is not not an option, right? It is. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the, the dollars on the budget. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, um, that may be a change since we. Um, out the paper, and that is that the decision's been made that all meetings held in the council chamber here will be live streamed and recorded. Right. So th these will be okay. that same will happen for them. Thanks for picking that up. So that's an amendment that needs to be made to that terms of reference. So I'll that. Councillor, okay. yep, thank you. Any other questions before we move through? Yep. Yeah, Councillor Ben Bates. Quick question before we go. Um, we put it. Um, Regarding to the objective 
the proposed objective five point uh, three point five, mm -hmm. what does provide oversight um, mean? For instance, if the regional transport committee would like to uh, move towards implementation on something of their agenda, does that mean that the this particular joint committee would have to have an input into that, or because it's if it if if, if it is true that we're only going to have three meetings a year, that could really slow down our process. Mm. Yeah. Do you like well, to try it's, and address that? Just speaking to that, uh, Madam Chair, I, I, I share that uh, potential risk, mm. um, and uh, I'd only used I'd, I'd put the term initially monitor, uh, which is sort of report back, and uh, but I had borrowed from the. Uh, delegated authority at 6.1. That's why I use those words. Maybe those words need to change instead of oversight, uh, change to monitor mm. uh, to, to, to make it clear that it's not um, authority to, um, if you like, alter, amend, do anything else with plans and activities that are going on. So your, your point is valid that maybe maybe our words are too go too far. So I wonder we, whether we in fact change that back both at 3.5 and at 6.1, um, change that to monitor if that's the right word. Mm. Was in three terms, mm. terms time that we may have a different council, except for Councillor Curtin. <laughs> <laughs> and then we might be in different. Yeah, I, I just want us to be cautious that it doesn't put this committee in the decision making position. Um, that it is merely, and I just want to clarify with you, Councillor Curden, that it's merely a avenue to report on those matters. Yeah, and th therefore, um, I think monitor is a better word than oversight, yeah. Yeah. which carries with it, you know, doing something. So just so that we're all aware that it means reporting back or even updating on those levels of service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more comment or questions before we move into the motions? <coughs> so we do have recommendations uh, one and two. Uh, we have three to adopt the terms of reference. Um, with the addition <coughs> of 3.5 that has just been um, discussed. Also four, five and six. So can I please have a mover for those? To check, can I just, yes. just clarify, uh, see clarification about whether we're going to adopt Councillor Kern's suggestion about, I think it was 6.1, is it? Um, six something. Red monitor. To, to change the monitor. Yeah, 6.1. So six. guiding and monitoring climate change mitigation and adaptation. So delete the words and providing oversight. Uh, sorry, delete providing oversight for and substitute with monitoring, guiding and, and monitoring. You're providing monitoring. So I, yeah. And with inclusion right. of the change of that. So if that is the um, if that is a motion, I'm mm -hmm. happy to happy, to, happy to, to propose that. Yeah. And a seconder? I'll second it. Thank you. Um, would you like to speak, either of you, to that? Okay. Well no? discussed. Any other speakers? All those who agree, say aye. Aye. Those against, carry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to our second decision item, which is regarding the hearings committee. Malcolm and Katrina are both here for this. Uh, would you like to come and speak to it? Come up to the front. Kilda. Uh, I'm Malcolm Miller, I'm the consensus manager here at the Regional Council, so uh, the hearings committee is sort of a key point of contact in terms of appointing, uh, particularly appointing commissioners for hearings, um, but in, in this paper we're just looking at whether it's needed to, to operate as a, and there is a need for a hearings committee or whether it could be done differently. Probably from experience we call the, the hearings committee together sort of 
um, irregularly as we require the appointment of commissioners, um, principally for that reason. It can be for resource consents hearings, or there's also provision where there's for um, pest management plan appointing commissioners to hear uh, submissions on that. Um, the, the paper is basically suggesting that we can do it differently. It could be done by the council. If we come to the council directly, appoint commissioners and have, have the delegations, etc., cetera, pass it to them that way. Or you could do it through another committee that meets on a more regular basis and just has, have it as something that we can add an item to um, as and when required. And the alternative, the third option is really to leave it as it is and continue with the hearings committee as we, as we have. So that's basically the, um, the executive summary. Thank you, Katrina. Do you have anything else to add? Yeah, look, ultimately it was just about looking for efficiency here. Um, Malcolm's articulated that well. It meets infrequently uh, complexity of consent applications and hearings uh, these days tend to mean that counts, uh, consent applications and hearings are heard by independent experts uh, largely. Mm -hmm. We do appoint um, we do appoint members to the panel to represent the cultural interests or uh, aspects of an application. Mm -hmm. uh, there is nothing to, su to suggest in this paper that that wouldn't continue. So it so not having a hearings panel doesn't mean that our current uh, members of either the Māori Committee, Regional Planning Committee or Council who are making good decision holders wouldn't be appointed. That would always be our first point, particularly in respect to those cultural matters. Thank you. So um, we do have the three options that you've presented and for us to discuss mm. um, and also to highlight some of the um, the positives but also maybe what's missing of the three options. Um, knowing that um, efficiency is what we're trying to achieve here um, and the agility to be able to appoint uh, panellists. Um, so I'll open it up for, for questions uh, regarding the three options. Um, I, I do have a concern, and there may be a, a simple solution, but I'm not sure what that could be. Um, with option one, with bringing um, some of those powers into council, which means every four weeks um, there's regularity, um, it does leave out the ability for what used to be a Māori committee representative and a Tangata Whenua RPC representative to have decision making over, over panellists, which happened in the um, hearings committee. So in that way, how can that be addressed in option, option one, if it can be at all? Option one is coming to council. Sorry. Mm. Yeah. So currently we, we do have or a Or another committee, EIC or Yeah, yeah. Uh yeah, that is that is a concern. Uh we could we could still seek advice from the Māori committee on appointments uh through papers. So uh through so we could do that rather than at a meeting, we could do it through um at times the hearing committee rather than meeting has agreed to do it through email rather than getting everybody. That is that is an option, but it's not particularly tidy, I admit that. Um, Petey, do you have any <coughs> views on um, ensuring that we have uh, tangata whenua representative uh, ability to, to speak and vote on appointing panellists to our resource consent hearings? It's... Um Certainly, the pathway that we've uh, recently adopted, mm. uh, getting to this point here, um, I'd be I'd, I'd be sort of I'd be advising that perhaps we sort of take that back. So it's it's been sort of something that's been given. Mm. I think to arbitrarily then take it away poses a bit of an issue. Mm -hmm. And but if we had an explanation and discussion, we could take to each of those committees. Mm -hmm to indicate that this is around efficiency and moving forward, but 
gauge their feedback and commentary on that. Yeah, that would absolutely. be a good, I'd advise that pathway. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Councillor Sears. Thank you. Um, through you, Chair, um, the efficiencies very important. We know that mm -hmm. a whole committee, running a committee, has um, basic costs irrelevant to its activity. And in five years, it's, it's only met nine times. So the decision making around those in five years is, is just not significant. So I think what we're looking for is the answer mm. that we have and just to be sure that however that is done with the Māori, Māori Committee or RPC is just going to um, ensure that that connection's made. So whatever that addition is to one would, makes the most sense. Mm. Any other questions or comments? Options. Thank you, James. Just at the risk of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, <laughs> uh, probably the most significant uh, mischief that we're seeking to remedy here is timeliness of decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, given that typically the appointment of commissioners relates to a, a resource consent application mm -hmm. uh, where the clock is ticking, uh, both from a statutory point of view for our obligations to process in uh, statutory timelines and also costs to all parties involved uh, in, in the process. And uh, the, um, the recent experience has been, uh, on occasion, some protracted processes to get those appointments. And I'm just a little concerned that if the expectation is that the appointment of commissioners, for example, would come to this table having gone through both the Māori Committee mm. and RPC or one or mm. the other, mm. the frequency with which those committees are meeting uh, could see a scenario where up to three months' time mm. is taken to navigate all of that prior to uh, uh, at, at this <coughs> table. One option could be that uh, the proposal before it comes to this table uh, is uh, provided to those committees for comment, not at a formal meeting, but out of session, so that they um, are able to provide commentary which is reflected in the paper. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is consultation with those committees outside of their normal meeting cycle. If that's not uh, desirable, then, then I, I, I'd caution against a, a track that is going to go through those committees. Mm -hmm. um, it is, look, it's, it is the practice in a number of councils to delegate these decisions to the chief executive or even a group manager level uh, on the basis of very operational decisions. Mm -hmm. We obviously uh, can only appoint uh, people with the requisite skills mm -hmm. and those decisions around appointments can be, um, uh, can be objected to uh, in any event and, 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 and elevated, I guess, if there is some controversy or so, some difficulty with it. Uh, and, and look, if, if there was delegation to, um, uh, to the chief executive uh, or a staff member, uh, we would have a practice of, of advising council in advance of those uh, appointments uh, prior to and giving an opportunity for council to express any reservations that might see it brought to a, a council meeting. Having said that, um, uh, and, and that could include representatives uh, from both the RPC and the Māori Committee, particularly those that are nominated to sit at this uh, council table. It's a more informal way of operating, but it could be a way in which uh, everybody is involved, has the opportunity for comment, but can move reasonably uh, expeditiously. I'll, I'll offer a, uh, you know, a personal view that uh, we have on occasion put an inordinate amount of um, effort and, and uh, deliberation into these appointments, often with no material change to the outcome by way of the composition of, of commissioners, uh, because you know obviously a lot of concern about who is on the panel considering a consent, but the consent process is so heavily prescribed by legislation um, that, that I would suggest that you know particular individuals shouldn't have a significant bearing on the uh, on the outcome of the consent as long as they do have the requisite skills and that's that's a precursor in any event. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just cautioning that we don't over sort of engineer this exercise. And I think it did work historically quite satisfactorily when the hearings committee very informally came together at the end of a council meeting, would meet quickly and be able to sign off. And because we have now uh, been more consultative around it, we've got ourselves into a situation where the committee 
uh, struggles to get quorum, struggles to get people together, there's requests to meet all in person, uh, and then you know, the, the, the mechanics of this have now become uh, disproportionate to the nature of the decisions involved. Mm -hmm. Comments? Yep, Councillor Harding. So I, I, my comments are separate, so maybe mm -hmm. just hold, holding comments. back until anyone wants to okay. address. Um, comments James. based on what James has just responded. Council. Yeah, just for information, the question here is efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the inefficiency we're dealing with right now? James, you alluded to it, but I think if you have a, a well-organised committee with a, a chairperson that understands the obligations of that person as the chair, what then is the inefficiency if that wasn't if that was the case? Is it cost? Is it time? Is it uh, decision-making time frames? So it's about pulling the committee together. So as James alluded to, it uh, well, as James stated, uh, yeah, so we we will need to uh, call a hearing committee um, and getting everybody together. That can happen after a council meeting, but there are members on the hearings committee that are not sitting at this table. They are part of the Māori committee. And so we need to get, get them to that meeting uh, as well. And often that can be a challenge because they're not already at the council. So getting everybody to meet at the same time has been challenging. Um, there is a desire to have those meetings in person. We've we tried to... Uh, move to a situation where we would uh, do uh, decision making via email and, and over papers, um, and that was done uh, once I, I mm -hmm. recall. Uh, but then there was new members and wanted to have a physical meeting. Um, so, and and all the while the time is ticking for consent mm -hmm. processing, and we need to get commissioners lined up who are very busy. And so you're really wanting to uh, be able to grab commissioners when they're available with the right expertise uh, without trying to preempt a decision of a committee that you're trying to get together as well. So there is inefficiency in terms of bringing uh, what is six people together, I think it is, or more uh, for a 10-minute meeting mm -hmm. in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. Would that not be the same if we actually had to go to and just have, as a council make the decision because we have to wait a month? For instance, if we just had a council meeting, mm -hmm. it could be to three, two weeks as well. So, so we know that consents, what consents are likely to go to hearings. So what our team would be doing is writing papers well in advance of that and bringing that to this council uh, and, uh, and having which we do now with the hearings committee, so we try to do that well in advance mm -hmm. and have commissioners lined up, but often things will change, and so we need to make changes uh, that haven't, that haven't, we haven't been able to do with the hearings committee because there's not that regular monthly cycle. Mm -hmm. but I articulated that as you see it. Councillor Roadley, um, through you, Chair. Um, thank you. Katrina... What on option two? What are the barriers or the negatives for bringing it through the EICC? Um, it, it is just that six weekly. Time. Time it's just the time. time. It's just the time. The, and so bring it. If but if the EICC uh, were another committee, whatever committee uh, had the decision making powers, and it doesn't need to come to council, then that's not so significant. Mm. And we, we we could work with that. Councillor says. Thank you. Through you, Chair. So just to clarify, it can be delegated to the Chief Executive or another manager and doesn't actually need to come back through a committee at all. Well, is that correct? Um, I, I don't think that is. Um, the, the RMA says you can delegate the powers. The Council can delegate powers, but, but they, they cannot delegate the power of delegation. That's so under Section 34. Um, so, so I don't feel that it can go to CE for him to then delegate on to... No, 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 yeah, party. that's quite, yeah. So, so to be clear, it wouldn't be a delegation to me and then me to delegate. It would either be a delegation to me or a delegation to, say, the group manager, policy and regulation. Yeah, so I, all the point I'm making is I'm not the only council officer that could be delegated to, but Melvin's no. quite right. A delegate, delegation to delegate is problematic. Sure. My, my question really was that it doesn't need to then come back through any committee no, that's at correct. all. That's correct. Correct. And at previous council I worked at, that was the situation. The delegation was to 
the group manager and those appointments were made, as you rightly say, chief executive on the basis of um, um, training and skills particular to the resource consent needed, and we never had any issues with that. So I'd be very supportive of that. It's not in this, but that's what I'd be supporting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Councillor Harding. Thank you, Chair. Um, just probably three points I wanted to make. Um, the first is, whilst we know that the hearings committee has only met five times in the last... Nine times. Sorry, nine times in the past five years. We also know that somewhere between seven and 900 consents are in the pipeline waiting to be processed. So um, I'm curious to know how that may or may not relate to the future work mm. of, of the hearings committee once we actually get to, to make decisions there. Um, that's the first point. The second point is um, one of the functions of the hearings committee it revolves around appeals. And I'm not clear... Um, and so the, the general, so a, 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 an opportunity for a party who's unhappy with the outcome of a consent process mm -hmm. to or a hearings process to go to appeal, and, and um, the, I have no clarity, <coughs> I need clarity about where that function lies, and I think, and my view is that there is an important check, and and that that, that value of actually being able to step outside of the, the process that the officers are in, in this, this area, whether that comes to, and uh, whether that's to elected members mm -hmm. or to the CEO, I'm a little bit more relaxed about, but that's really, really important. So we, don't, we can't lose sight of that in any restructure that we make. Okay. Um, and, and the third point I'd make is that, that in, in terms of the solution of delegating more or some of the responsibilities to, to officers, we just probably need a second go at this and a little bit more clarity about if that's part of a package of options, mm -hmm. but more specific about, about what that is. Mm -hmm. But I certainly accept the basic proposition that the hearings committee, the, the time frame, that this is not a, a well-functioning, it's, it's not fit for purpose in the way that it operates. And the fact that, that as, as Malcolm's paper Clearly points out is that there is a process, is, you know, there is a statutory requirement to go through to form, form mm -hmm. you know, committee to op for to operate properly and not default to, to email and that sort of thing. There's a timeline, and a process, public um, notification, that sort of thing. So, I completely agree that probably that what we've got can be improved, um, mm -hmm. but I think we probably just need a second go based on this discussion of what that might look like. There's three, three. Points. There is three Thank questions. Uh, I'll go to the second question first. If uh, the council is making decisions on commissioners, uh, it is objections that you're talking about, not appeals. Appeals go to the Environment Court. Objections come back to council, so those are decisions that officers have made yep. and, an, and an applicant can object. Two different things. Uh, that would come back to the council. Understood. So whoever's got the delegation for making the decision for commissioners gets the delegation for objections. Uh, in terms of uh, the tank consents that are sitting there, one, we have to point out quite clearly that there is no notification decisions being made on any of those yet. Uh, if those consent applications were needing to go to a hearing, we wouldn't be having hearings for individual consents. We would be batching them and having uh, a, 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 a group and catchment-based hearings for bulk consents uh, that would be heard together. So it's still the decision on that is still uh, for either a council or a hearing committee to appoint commissioners uh, to those uh, hearings. And then the third point about delegations, the intent was always to come back to council with an additional paper on what uh, matters of the Act could be further delegated to staff. Can I come back to the point about appeals? The, the provision that we do have is that if, if an appeal is lodged to a resource consent, we, go to, we, we attend the Environment Court hearing, and uh, basically we would defend the decision. And then if there's negotiation around amending that, we seek delegation and... and we have delegation um, through, through our delegations manual now for officers to attend and 
negotiate basically with sort of, sort of within the brief of um, negotiating con sort of consistent with the nature of the decision that was made. Mm -hmm. Okay, last, last. Yeah, I'll just question. make a point that yeah. based on the reading of, of the functions of the existing functions of the hearing committee, it appears to read as though that there is a, a, an appeals function in there, a, an objections function, and so I'd like clarity about whether that, you know, that any change we make, we're not, we're not interfering with that, we're not reducing that, the opportunity or the process around the that, that appeals provision objections. Is, is, there is provision for uh, us to come back to the hearings committee to seek delegation when, when we are processing uh, or involved in appeals. But we have the delegation as well, so it's been delegated down, but with an ability to say, actually, we want to come back to the to the hearings committee to actually get some direction. Yep. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments around those options? I'm not sure we've landed anywhere, um, other than we need to have that conversation with the Māori committee and RPC. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. Just one point I was thinking of saying earlier was that, and we do mention it in here, we have we do have the suggestion of a pool of sort of standing commissioners. Or two, there's yeah. two things. We sort of basically have a, a list of potential commissioners, um, and then we're talking about having a pool where we could perhaps have them have them delegated the function and then draw from that pool to say, well, we've got some matters that we we would like you to be involved in. But that, that overall list is something I was thinking the Maori Committee could influence or other parties could sort of have an input into to say, yeah, we want to see what well, we think. These these are all qualified people who should be on the list. Make sure that they're identified and, and we can know that they're there and available yeah. for accessing. And so they would become a part of the pool and the powers would be delegated to the CE to pull from those recommended oh. pools. Yes. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, I, I, I think I'm still. I, I don't believe that the CE has the delegation to appoint those people. I, I don't know if James has okay. agreed with that that point, but in my view, James can be delegated the power to hear a, a, to sit on a hearings panel and make it make that decision. But as CE, he can't be delegated the power to then delegate delegate to, to, to somebody to make that or to appoint someone to make okay. that decision. Mm. We haven't discussed this prior, so I haven't sort of clarified it. So, so in my view, if we had a poll, we've still got to go somewhere to actually have those people appointed. So, that, yeah, the way I had contemplated it wouldn't be me being delegated as a commissioner and then delegating that power to hear the, hear the consent to the commissioner. It would, it would be me being delegated to a point on behalf of the council, mm -hmm. the commissioners. So just in the way I'm presently delegated to undertake all sorts of acts on behalf of council uh, by law, uh, I would be doing your appointment, if you like. So whether that's a delegation to delegate, I think, it's, I think thought of it more as a delegation to appoint mm -hmm. as, and, and appointing your delegate. But that's something we possibly need some legal advice on, or just review the legislation on. Mm. Yeah. If I could just add and perhaps requalify what I've indicated earlier on. So something that through council that we're tasked with, and particularly through the Māori Partnerships Group, is actually sort of growing the pool uh, of tangata whenua <coughs> qualified MGDs, mm -hmm. whether it's from Māori Committee or whether it's within Regional Planning Committee. So that's something that we're active and tasked with, is to grow them not only as MGD practitioners, but also as chair people within that process. So that's one thing which is complementary to this. I think the other part is, and this is re-qualifying what I'd indicated earlier, I certainly wasn't intending that at every consent application that we take that back to either the Māori Committee or the Regional Planning Committee. It was more so the case that in terms of this initial sort of structural paper, mm -hmm. that was what we would take there. Yeah. And certainly option one, uh, we have both Māori Committee and Regional Planning representatives who sit at Regional Council on that four-weekly basis. So it could work. So are we happy to move on in terms of um, taking this paper to the Māori Committee and the RPC for their feedback? 
on the options for discussion, or are we in a position where we'd like to endorse an option to take to the Māori Committee in the RPC? On the 8th and the 15th, On the 8th and the 15th. Because there are a lot of ands and ors in the recommendation. I'm not quite sure we've landed. Yes, Chair, I, I wonder if we're over-egging this a bit. Um, you know, we, we are asking these guys to be better in the way they operate and more efficient in the way they operate, and um, taking all the discussions into account, I do feel option one does the trick. In particular, uh, paragraph 19, which covers off a lot of, a lot of the things I think that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Any other comments about that? Wolf Jock's moving that, I'll second it. Yep. I'll move. Is yep. that what you'd like to move? Yep. For option one? Yep. Second it. I'll better second that. Mm -hmm. Alongside, so that, that is one option. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have other recommendations there. It's just three and four, isn't it? Just establish one, two, three, four, and possibly six. That the officers prepare a report yep. for the council to consider uh, around the delegation uh, functions of the staff. Mm -hmm. and Chair, before you just take a take a, a vote or any debate on the on the motion, I thought I'd just <coughs> uh, read you the <coughs> excuse me the provisions of the of the legislation that probably create um, the confusion. So, um, section thirty four A of the RMA and I was a local authority made to delegate to an employee or hearings commissioner appointed by the local authority any functions, powers, or duties under under the Act. So, any powers under the Act, except and, and the first is approving a policy statement or plan which is probably um, mm -hmm. a given, or this power of delegation. So uh, Malcolm's right, you can't delegate to delegate, mm. but I, I think that goes to the question about whether you're delegating a delegation or you're delegating the appointment uh, mm. function. And that's the thing which I think we just need to clarify because uh, any functions, powers or duties under the Act is pretty broad, mm -hmm. uh, and I would have thought that, that would capture that, but I think that's just a... Legal tautology that needs um, clarification, uh, and just for I guess the other thing just to reinforce is that uh, if a local authority is considering appointing one or more hearings commissioners, uh, the local authority must consult Tangata Whenua through relevant iwi authorities and whether it is appropriate to appoint a commissioner with the understanding of Tikanga Māori and perspectives of local iwi or hapu. Um, uh, so yeah, obviously you know that that is done uh, through through Māori committees. So consultation uh, with um, uh, either directly with the authorities or through um, uh, through multi committee is, is is an essential and is a given. So there's no suggestion of cutting that out of the process mm -hmm. by way of change here. It's really just about the mechanics of this being as efficient as possible. Okay. So are you suggesting that um, that we investigate the delegation to appoint and look at perhaps an even easier way that isn't in these list of options and come back with perhaps a more simple option based on that information. Is that what you're suggesting? Look, I, I, I think so. I think there's sufficient ambiguity yep. between us right now over, over this that we wouldn't want you to uh, make a resolution you have to then rescind. Um, mm -hmm. But if in principle you favour uh, option uh, uh, one, one, one and you would like some further advice on it, then I think we could bring that back. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got on the table um, option one, two... Uh, three, four, and six, uh, with the proviso of further information around those delegations of the CE. Um, we have a mover and a seconder. Any other comments with moving those? All those who agree, say aye. 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 Yes, carried. Thank you very much. Thank you for stepping <coughs> us through. I know it wasn't easy. That's right.
Um, but we, we do have to get these right and yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we are on to our next item, which is the Council's submission on the Spatial Planning Bill and the Natural Built Environments Bill. Who have we got, James? We got Gavin? No. Whether he is running late, uh, let's just proceed on the basis of the, uh, the conversation that's happened uh, to date with Council. So just to look, reinforce the fact that um, uh, submissions originally closed uh, for uh, submissions on the uh, two pieces of legislation on the 5th of February. We have uh, subject to, um, subsequent to this paper being uh, finalised, uh, had approval from the Select Committee for an extension to uh, 19 February for a submission from Council. Um, broadly, what staff are recommending is that we don't duplicate the efforts of other uh, entities that represent uh, local government, uh, local government managers and also regional councils uh, of the country. Uh, we are engaged with uh, all three bodies in the preparation of their resource, sorry, their submissions on <coughs> legislation and, uh, and, and therefore believe that the council's interests will be adequately uh, represented through those processes more generally, uh, but there are specific circumstances that relate to the Hawke's Bay Regional Council uh, in statute that are unique to this council, uh, and therefore it is recommended that we focus on those matters uh, in our submission. Um, they obviously relate particularly to the Hawke's Bay Re Regional Planning Committee Act 2015 uh, and the potential impact on that committee and its work through the reforms. Um, staff have commenced preparation of a draft uh, submission for consideration by Council uh, and what we're seeking today is delegation to a subset of Council uh, to uh, approve that submission prior to uh, the 19th of February uh, and, uh, and we'll certainly circulate that at the end of next week uh, and convene a further discussion of Council on the nature of that submission. Mm -hmm. uh, that submission will be uh, made publicly available uh, in due course uh, for um, uh, ratepayers and citizens of the uh, residents of, of the region's uh, visibility uh, and it certainly would be intended that we would be uh, sharing the submission as it is developed with our Māori Committee and our Regional Planning Committee, in particular PSGs, uh, so they're aware of uh, Council's views prior to them being submitted. Thank you, James. Quite straightforward. Any questions? Yes, Just for clarification um, through you, you Chair, um, and we would expect that the um, individual entities within the Regional Planning Committee and Māori Committee will make, be making their own submissions specific to their Absolutely, and we understand that they are. Yes. Great, thank you. Councillor Van Bake? No? Councillor Harding? Just, I think, for the benefit of anyone uh, viewing or listening to this afternoon's proceedings and trying to get their head around what the SPA and the NBA and all these things actually mean, what, what's the underlying substance of what we're talking about and, and why are we concerned about it, um, the way I would sum, sum it up is that uh, it's, it's well known and well tra traversed that there are um, shortcomings in the existing Act, the RMA, and that, that is in the process of being the Resource Management Act being in the, in the process of being replaced. One of the key concerns for this council is that in that process and in the focus that, uh, that's around uh, spatial planning and the need to provide more affordable housing that is one of the drivers of the one of many, but one of the key drivers of the, the replacement of the RMA, that the importance of the environment is not lost, is not traded off uh, uh, against um, against those other against things like housing requirements. So that's 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 the big un underlying challenge for us as as stewards of the environment to ensure that that doesn't happen. And within that, there's for Hawke's Bay specifically. The greatest challenge for us appears to be around uh, environment, democracy, and the um, the governance of environmental issues in the context of, of this rewrite of our of our founding acts. So that is, and, and every region is different in their structure, and and we're especially different because we have the 2015. Uh, 
RPC, Regional uh, Planning Act. And that's, that's a tell for us that we've been uh, learning to, to all, on all sides to, as to how that works and how, you know, and we've come a long way, I think, since 2015 towards a partnership in governing the environment. It's going to be very challenging, though, to figure out how these structures look like under the future, and it's very unclear at the moment for us how those structures are going to play out under this new Natural and Built Environments Act and the Strategic Planning Act. So that's a central challenge, and the challenge is to, is to uh, and, and the desire, I think, of, of this table is to ensure that we still have a, a strong voice for the environment in that structure. So, that's, so when it comes to our submission, I expect that the, the strong focus, our point of difference, and the, and the most important thing we need to bring to the table in Wellington is the particular challenge we have to be balancing all those interests in Hawke's Bay around the environment. Thank you, Councillor Harding. Any other comment or question? Thank you, Doc. Uh, yeah, I had another comment to make along similar lines. Um, the RMA carries with it swathes of complexity and with that mm -hmm. cost, and I think I read in one of the papers that New Zealand's a world leader in that, like we chart, we have about five times as much compliance associated with it as other countries do. So I think that's something that we need to be mindful of in what we say. Um, the only other point I had to make um, alongside that was um, the other entities such as uh, local government New Zealand and so on, whose opinions we largely agree with, um, whilst we're not going to double up on that ground, I think we should also be looking to endorse those opinions. Yes, so it, it is, is reasonably common when we make submissions on legislation that we reference at the front those other submissions of um, membership organisations that we're party to whose submissions we endorse, and uh, I think in this case there's no, no reason why we wouldn't. Uh, look, from the, this suggestion, uh, we'll take away f from today's meeting a suggestion that we do precisely that, and as part of finalising the uh, submission, uh, draw to Council's attention any concerns we might have about any areas where we might depart from the views of those membership organisations. Any other questions, comments? No, um, and just to add to... Um the sentiment around um, ensuring uh, that our environmental protection and enhancing functions aren't diluted um, in the reform and that that's reflected very strongly in our submission. Um, the other uh, point to just raise is that there is uh, the recommendation to have a smaller group work on this um, on behalf of the council. Uh, before the submission uh, needs to go in. So there is mention of Councillor um, Foley, Hukianga, Williams mm -hmm. um, and myself uh, are part of that smaller committee to prepare that submission on our behalf, given the times that we do have. The time frame we have. Um, so if there are no other comments or questions to this item, um, I'm happy to move uh, the recommendations that are in here. Can I please have a second though? Councillor um, Sears, uh, any comments? There are none. All those who agree, say aye. 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 Those against, carry. Thank you very much. Right, the Register of Members' Pecuniary Interests. Who would like to lead this oh, Leanne, item? Leanne is the author of the paper. Uh, hopefully it's very straightforward. It is just a uh, enhancement of the status quo. Um, yes, through you, Chair, uh, the paper can really be taken as read and I'll just try and um, answer any questions you might have. It's, um, in my mind, it's quite different from what we've done in the past, but it doesn't seem to be anything, anything unorthodox or unexpected in it. So it's just an additional uh, requirement um, for councillors as per the reg uh, legislation. Thank you. Any questions for Leanne? Very straightforward. Councillor Harvey? I'd just make the point um, through you, Chair Leanne. Thank you very much for the briefing paper. Once I found a little bit confusing up front as, as, as to 
what the differences were, but as soon as you actually work through and read the return itself, it becomes pretty self-explanatory. So just suggest to any of my colleagues that are not quite clear, if you work through the, uh, the return form itself, you'll, you'll find that it's actually pretty straightforward. Yes, question. And also, I'll commend you on your politeness. Uh, normally, we have a, <laughs> we do actually have a, um, um, a code of conduct unspoken that uh, people who present paper that we actually thank them for doing that. And actually, today you're the first one to be thanked for doing that. So I think it's really good because they do. Uh, our staff put a lot of effort, emphasis and effort into those papers, so it's really important. <laughs> Um, now, I just wanted to know, um, it does seem there's actually no jurisdiction that tells us what to do. We just have to do it, correct? Uh, the Local Government Act is yes. those, yes. But even yes. the registrar, registrar won't actually ring me up when it's day 121 and tell me, Jeriff, once again, you know, you've failed to submit the required <laughs> paperwork. Oh, I would suggest otherwise. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... I would the think that we would be pretty remiss in our jobs if we didn't say, well, you know, um, your your yearly update of your pecuniary interests mm -hmm. is due, okay. you know, by X date. So here's the form. So that will be your duty. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I, all I, need need to know. I just need to know which which which. <laughs> Leanne's uh, a great reminder. <laughs> uh, no other questions for this item. No. Can I please have a mover and a seconder for those recommendations? Councillor Harding, Councillor Van Bake, all those who agree say aye. Aye. Um, right. Those against, carried. Thank you. <coughs> Fixing the common seal. I'm happy to move this. I did it for three years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing it again. <laughs> oh, it, it might be an opportunity, actually, because I'm not sure if uh, the new councillors um, have had the opportunity to understand what a fixing the common seal means. Uh, so, James, I'll hand that over to you. Uh, so this is um, uh, this is a little bit like uh, uh, delegations conversation we had a little bit earlier. Uh, it's about council resolving to use its legal powers to uh, execute a uh, either a delegation or a, um, a legal uh, transaction, usually property transactions. So you will typically see two things come uh, for the common seal of council. Um, one is uh, for delegations, and whenever a new staff member joins, they uh, will have almost most most staff that join will have some delegated powers, typically under uh, the Civil Defence and Emergency Management Act. Given that um, all staff in the organisation have obligations uh, in a civil defence emergency, and that enables them to carry out functions uh, that have been uh, delegated from the Civil Defence Controller. Uh, as well as typically under things like the Resource Management Act and, uh, as you can see in here, the Biosecurity Act, uh, where we've got officers on the ground. So it's it's giving them the legal power to act on your behalf and the common seal uh, is the, uh, the stamp of approval, if you like, of that. Uh, and to, uh, uh, to transfer uh, property in and out of the council's ownership requires that as well. So when we have... Um, properties under the leasehold land that have been freeholded, they come to this process just for your official sign-off. So, so we've you. got common seals here and uncommon seals down at Marineland. Is that how it works? <laughs> Are you happy to Marine move? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Councillor Curtin. It's a skate park. <laughs> of uncommon oh, seals. And I'm happy to yeah. second that. So all those who agree say aye. 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 Are those against carried. Thank you very much. We're doing well, team. So we will push on through... Um, until our afternoon tea break at 10 past three. So uh, next we have the strategic projects report. Thank you, Chair. So we have uh, a number of group managers available to answer questions in, in relation uh, to these. I guess the, the reasonably common theme that you will see coming through the major strategic projects, all of which come really from the current long-term plan, uh, our impacts on progress by um, uh, kind of illness, COVID-related um, uh, staffing availability questions and to some extent uh, weather as well. So, look, I, I would just say as a general comment, uh, the organisation, like uh, most, if, if not all, larger organisations uh, in the national economy at the moment continue to uh, struggle with securing all of the um, staff, particularly in areas of 
technical specialty uh, that are in hot demand nationally uh, for all of our work, and uh, the rolling impacts of, of, of health um, have continued to have an impact. And of course, we've had the wettest uh, summer on uh, record in, uh, in the region. And so with respect to physical and capital projects and including uh, activities on the land with uh, farmers and landowners, that also is providing a bit of a, bit of a headwind. So that's a, just, a, I guess, a common theme. Uh, most of the uh, risks reported to you are either stable or, uh, or decreasing as a consequence of the mitigations we've got in place. So uh, nothing... Uh, trending upwards at this moment that we um, uh, feel that we need to bring to your attention. Thank you, James, and uh, and thank you to all the um, execs here who um, help make sure that our projects are running smoothly. Uh, so it's time for for questions. Um, Councillor Hardy. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Three questions for Ian, um, if I may. Um, Right tree, right place, now land for life. I'm just interested in just a little bit more of the backstory about about that uh, rebranding mm. and whether that signals a change in direction or not. That's the first point. Mm -hmm. um, second point, I noticed supply chain risks for seedlings and labour and supplier poles, and I've already... Um, Ian's already aware that I'm sort of kicking around in the, in the uh, pole supply... Area because I have a concern of that that I don't want to see the council uh, ending up or the council's constraints around pole supply getting in the way of doing what of farmers doing what what they need and want to do uh, for improving the environment in their backyards. And the third point, and it's, it's, it's relating to this, and, and further on in the report, there's um, a mention of the uh, freshwater farm plan regime rollout. Uh, due early this year and challenges around resourcing. And I'd like at some point, and possibly there's uh, an, a, an item that could be brought to Council sometime soon, hopefully, um, just an up, update on freshwater farm planning regime because this has such massive implications not only for the, the, um, the requirements right across Hawke's Bay for our rural landowners as a new item of compliance, but it's also going to drive a whole lot of new uh, works um, driving towards uh, catchment outcomes that have that are yet to be agreed. So it's a mass, going to be a massive piece, piece of work and we're going to need to be very integrated in our response around it. Yeah. Council and Deputy Mayor, welcome. Nice to see you all. Is that working? Doesn't sound like it. No, we missed all that nice stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Check. Yeah. Yep. Right, there we go. It's just connecting. Perhaps if I start with your last question first, I think perhaps the easiest thing is to bring you back as you suggest a bit of an update on the farm plans. What I would say is that we're in a better position now than we have been in the past with auditing capacity um, and a more integrated approach across both my area of business and Katrina's in that work and we are at the moment working on the development of a, um, uh, let's call it a, 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 an MOU or code of practice that we might have with the farm plan providers to make sure that everybody understands the rules of the game and that we're all operating at the level required. So feeling far more confident now about where we're at than perhaps a year ago and more confident rolling into the the next round of planning in the in the Tuki Tuki catchment and certainly in preparation for the um, farm plan regulations which are you know about to land on us. But I think the easiest thing to do would be to bring you back all of that information and advice. Um, so the, the supply chain issues really relate to um, if we're late, as the as the paper indicates, um, in developing the, the whole farm. No batteries. No, I'm not even talking about it. Your time limit is up. The green lights come back on. Um, where was I? Yeah, so the supply chain issues really relates to the fact that we haven't been able to get the whole farm afforestation plans developed 
uh, the number developed that we wanted to by now and we're at the point of having to order seedlings for those properties but we don't know what the plans are and we haven't confirmed with the landowner so it's kind of a timing and sequencing issue. With regard to polls, um, I think I did bring a discussion of polls to council last year, it may not have been to this council and again perhaps we need to bring you that back again. There is quite a bit of work happening across the sector trying to work out how we respond to demand for poles, um, whether the, the, our traditional three metre pole or whether the rooted cuttings or any other method or, or process. Um, we've got some big projects that are operating around the country that are you know, really sucking up supply. Kaipan Moana is a good example. 100,000 poles, three metre poles a year just going to that project alone. The challenge is it takes some time to develop a nursery and grow those things. And um, demand can be, you know, a variable. So we're trying to work out how we respond to that. We would like to... We would like to um, have uh, ideally one nursery operating for the North Island instead we have a plethora of them around the region and Hawke's Bay is actually quite a good place to grow them because of our soils, climate and relatively reliable water but it's certainly an area that we're focusing on and I could perhaps through the ICC bring you back some more information about that um, during the year. The last question around Land for Life, yes, um, and again, what we're going to be doing for this whole project now is bringing you uh, in about May, June this year a comprehensive update because we're at a, we'll be at a pretty important go no go point, including a detailed business plan. Um, Land for Life grew out of uh, ongoing narrative we've had from the farmers we've been engaging with the development of the pilots to say that right through right place is probably in their view outdone its utility. It's used widely by many people in many different fora and has many different connotations. So we engaged Tractor, who are a local um, marketing engagement firm, to uh, consider alternative um, imagery and branding for the, for the project and they did that. We then took those proposals to our farmer community and said what do you think and the overwhelming feedback was that Land for Life better resonated with them because it represents not just the fact that you're talking about um, you know, a resilient property today but actually the intergener intergenerational nature of the investment and the thinking that goes with it. Um, so so that's sort of locked and loaded now as the new way forward. We do recognise that right tree, right place will still have a, a place somewhere, maybe in the, you know, um, land for life formerly known as type of um, approach. But um, uh, we think that right, uh, the land for life branding is the one that will be most useful for, for us to take forward and get better uptake from the farming community. Thank you, Ian. I compliment you on the choice. Um, you know, I agree. Right to right places is um, so so widely used and so and so loaded with meaning that it's it's probably a very good move to um, to see you know to clarify that we, that we have a specific project rather than just a generality. Thank you. Yeah, the question, Councillor says. Thank you through you, Chair. Um, well, a clarification and then a, a question for Ian. Um, this is the, the sort of dashboard or traffic lights of, mm. of a summary of what's going on. So usually, I'm assuming, these things would have been through um, the relevant committees and discussed if necessary, and then they might come through here as a summary. Is that what would usually happen? Mm, I don't yeah. believe they go through committees. So if we have a... Yeah, carry on, Councillor. Yes. If we have a specific... So, for example... Um, the discussion around um, Ian, the catchment advisor for Karamu and Ahiriri, and we wanted to know a little bit more about that. We'd have that here, or usually something like this would have been through EICC and there would have been a, a broader discussion? That would typically have come through the significant activities report looking forward, um, and it's probably a question best asked by, answered by Chris, because that's um, his urban catchment coordinators. Okay. Yeah. So, can you talk a little bit about that then, um, Chris? Yes, yeah, so happy to talk about our uh, catchment advisors for Ahuri and, uh, and Karamu. So, um, they were new roles through the last LTP, um, and they were 
uh, it was staged, so they didn't start the first day of the new LTP. From a cash flow perspective, they were to start, I think, three quarters of the way through the f first year. Um, recruiting to those roles has been very challenging. We've, despite multiple attempts, I think four attempts on the Aruri catchment one, we, we haven't found anyone suitable. And we had someone uh, uh, who started about seven months ago for the Katamu. Uh, that person in the academy role has subsequently resigned, uh, so we're back to no one in the roles. So we're having a, a critical think about um, where those roles are placed in the scheme of what's happening. And we know, for example, with Three Waters, Entity C, under, this, under its legislation, will be required to have urban catchment management plans with actions, and they need to have that in place by 2028. There's a whole lot of... Uh, um, um, I guess other resources around catchment planning and so I've got a bit of work to do with Ian uh, in terms of his advisors and a coordinator of coordinators which is being funded um, and we know that there's other things happening in central government as well. So we really just wanted to take stock and see if that's an area where we could provide a, a saving because others are doing it or we'll really come back and say it's absolutely necessary. So we're just having a think through that um, at the moment before we go back to market. And just to maybe clarify your yeah. question earlier, is that this dashboard of projects comes to council, but when there are major decisions <sighs> needed, in terms of these projects, they come through committee, right. or yeah. we discuss them through workshop. Yeah. So in terms of what we've just discussed, what Chris has just talked about, that will come back through a committee once you've got um, some suggestions or a report on where that might go, or it'll come back to full council? <laughs> So we probably, uh, well, well, first we need to look at, um, I guess, the timing. Um, so the reason that's here is that's something that's happened this month and we felt it was important for everyone to have visibility. And the, the more substantial discussion, it's probably a topic for the EICC. So we talk to uh, the chair and uh, deputy chair around how that gets on the agenda and whether it's a priority for the next meeting. Thank you. Further questions? Yeah, um... 6.6 and then 6.2, this is in regards to the appeals and the court require the council to consult with parties to, to their appeals and preparing a response to its directions. Um, just give me a bit of visibility for if I can. Mediation with the appellants, um, who actually deals with that mediation within our council? How's, the, how's that being dealt with? James, Trina, what you want? Through you, Staff have delegated that responsibility uh, to mediate those through. Uh, currently, we are not even close to that point, though. We are still working through timelines. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Madam Chair. Yeah, Councillor um, Kirby. Yeah, Madam Chair, I, um, I just want to, uh, firstly, um, I've been looking in specific for a commentary on the Napier Urban Waterways um, and the drain scheme, um, and I'm not seeing it in the strategic projects and nor in the significant organisational activities. Um, um, and I think we can correct that, but it does raise for me the way in which we are um, reporting um, what is a strategic project versus what is a significant activity. Uh, and I note the cross uh, crossover and commentary from both reports, and I wonder whether um, it's time to reconsider, um, if you like, um, rationalising the, the two types of report, um, um, just so that we are we're, we're clear on what that reporting framework looks like, whether it's a traffic light scenario or else. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, if, uh, perhaps if Chris could help me out with... Um, uh, the um, consideration of the Napier Urban Waterways and where it should, yep. where, where does it sit, where should it sit, yep. and what, what can, he, can he update it? Yeah, thank you. So uh, in terms of the two reports, the correct place for that uh, is on our significant organisational activities looking forward. Uh, and I apologise for it not uh, having a place and um, I've made myself a note to actually alter the template to make sure it's in there. Um, so as a brief update, um, 
uh, on what's happening with Napier. There's two key pieces of work. One is to look at the relationship between Napier City Council and Hawke's Bay Regional Council and how our infrastructure works together. Um, and after the elections, we're in a position to reignite um, that work after some, uh, I guess, a view from Napier City Council not to progress it uh, through the election period. Um, so that's where we've presented through two workshops now um, a, a, an improved framework um, to have one accountability for the operation of the network and several options that we have looked at. Um, and so we're going to yeah, reignite that work and Napier City Council have assigned some resources to work with us on that. So that's uh, happening now. The second one is uh, the infrastructure review of uh, particularly our components uh, of the Napier Urban Waterway Network. And so we've taken Napier's model, uh, we've added ours, we've looked at the whole entire network, we've focused on the open waterway components um, and as we promised uh, last year we'll be bringing a paper uh, either in a workshop or paper we still have to work through that detail uh, at the end of February or to, or to the uh, March EICC meeting so I'm talking that we've got a gender setting meeting tomorrow for the EICC so I'll be proposing that we bring a paper or workshop to the EICC and give visibility of the uh, the outcomes of some of that work uh, that we've done on the Napier waterways, some of the pathways or investment pathways to improve the performance and also give visibility as to some of the key activities that Napier City are also undertaking and then provide some comment and direction back from that. So that's our plan to come to the March EICC meeting, which is early March, um, and have that paper available towards the end of February. Thank you. Just supplementary, Madam yep. Chair. I just wanted, Chris, if you could help me yep. in terms of um, where we place our reporting thereof, um, because I'm, I'm seeing... Um, I'm seeing that whole process as being somewhat of a, of a strategic project, although yep. you're, you're indicating that you're seeing it as a significant piece of work. Yep. It's probably got elements of both. So I just wonder yep. whether you could clarify, you know, where we, where, where is it best place to report? I'm looking yep. at, for example, Section 8 in the um, yep. strategic projects and thinking it sits alongside those potentially. So the strategic projects report is based on an agreed list of strategic projects that was, I think, developed out of the LTP and is a defined list. Uh, anything that's not on that list, uh, we report in the significant organisational activities. So the, the place uh, for it uh, is in the significant activities by group under asset management. There's a new template being trialled, uh, so we welcome feedback. Uh, it used to be more of a place-based north, middle, south uh, it's now in um, functional units uh, of the regional council, so there's an asset management section and, and we'll put the update in that. Uh, I guess uh, we can look at whether it should be included in a strategic project, but there has been a process uh, to agree precisely what, what those are and the reporting requirements. Yeah, and um, just on that, just appreciating you trying to um, find um, ways to improve those reporting processes. Yep. processes. Um, so yeah, thank you for that explanation. Um, but if we do have any feedback on particularly those two and how we'd like to see adjustments, back to James. Yeah, thank sure. you. Uh, Did you have one more question? Madam Chair, if I, if I could uh, turn to um, item 13 in the project summaries. Um, and uh, I just this is essentially the benefit of uh, our new councillors. Um, and I wonder whether we could just have a quick um, summation of the, the term synergy, uh, technology one, iris, and opal three, please, <laughs> uh, in about uh, <clears throat> 10 words. Do the workshop on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, if I can start with point 13 on page 51. So synergy is the implementation um, of a new accounting system called technology one. Uh, I have referred to that system before with you. So uh, Synergy uh, has been going, um, started with a program called Fuse three years ago, uh, and it is progressively implementing uh, the accounting system, but making enhancements to that through the uh, program to include accounts receivable, accounts payable, uh, payroll, uh, fixed assets, etc. That program of work is likely to continue until later this year. 
uh, August, where we will move away from a project phase into a BAU. Uh, so that uh, synergy program is linked to number 10 on page 50, which is the enterprise asset management. So as part of progressing uh, and enhancing and integrating our systems uh, to be more effective, uh, we are also going to put in the enterprise assets. Uh, so they are not our fixed assets in our buildings. These are Chris Dolly's uh, floodgates. They are stock banks, etc. So that system and technology one will allow us to manage end-to-end -end, uh, some of those infrastructure assets, including ongoing maintenance, additions, uh, etc., uh, through one system. Uh, Neil, you also asked uh, about Opal 3 and Iris. Uh, I'm just going to pass you to the CIO uh, to talk about Iris. Thank you. Through you, Chair. Uh, so the IRIS program, uh, you may recall we spoke last year about establishing the Regional Shared Service Organisation. And one of the key programs uh, to be delivered by that Regional Shared Service is the IRIS Next Generation program. So this is um, a number of councils working together um, to develop a modern solution for our consenting compliance and land management functions. And... Um, so Hawke's Bay Regional Council are participating in that program and the uh, another key foundation for the program is consistent good practice. So we're establishing consistent business processes across uh, functions such as consenting across the participating councils and then building that into the system that we will implement um, through a, an integrated work program across the councils. And Opal 3, uh, is there a specific question about that or do you just require context on what the system just is? Just a general overview of what it is. Yeah. So Opal 3 is, is a reporting platform. We pull some financial information in and um, put it alongside management comments from staff uh, on the various programs uh, that are reported through Opal. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, reporting against. I'm probably not the expert for this question, <laughs> but um, so it's also used. All of that information's in a quarterly report. Yeah. Yep. Can you repeat that, sorry? All of the information and in Opal Three is also put through into the quarterly report, so the organisational mm -hmm. performance reporting all the non-financial measures Thank you. collated there. Thank you. <laughs> sorry to do that to you. <laughs> um, question from Councillor Foley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just um, up took a flood control another month, another heavy rain event. Actually, probably Ian for a start. Um, just downstream from Waipawa, continue to get the calls post the heavy event like that. That um, you know, huge concern around the uh, gravel extraction being because of Chilean needlegrass. Any update then on sort of that um, management of that plant pest and? Yeah, sort of thoughts in that area? Sure, Mr. Dole might want to comment as well. Um, we've been pushing staff reasonably hard to come up with um, some options for um, looking at trials of uh, extraction for um, um, you know, getting gravel out using practical pragmatic techniques by, but at the same time minimising and mitigating risk around CNG. Um, so that's a piece of work that's on the go at the moment. Um, the collaboration between biosecurity staff and asset management, and um, we've also I'm also pushing our biosecurity team to um, uh, re revisit and push forward and, and work with asset management to look at funding options for the the longer term but more comprehensive investigation that Ag Research we're going to do to look at you know plant pest management and gravel generally. Um, but the reality is that for a widespread large-scale gravel extraction, there's still no silver bullet that doesn't carry a reasonable amount of risk uh, from a biosecurity perspective. But Chris may want to add to that. Well, just to reiterate uh, Ian's uh, comments that we're moving forward and the teams are working um, well together on that, and I think we will see some, some practical outcomes um, shortly. In terms of asset the management focus, we're certainly aware of the erosion that's occurred in the location um, you've talked about. Um, and we'll be 
uh, doing some resurveying and adjustment to priorities as a result of that and any decisions that come out of um, the biosecurity in terms of how we deal with CNG. We've got a, a number of erosion issues on the on the Waipawa, so all that's business as usual for us. Uh, the team are assessing uh, and putting sort of countermeasures in, in place over time. Just, um, yeah, sure. yeah, please, um, just um, on the general um, IG scheme, um, you know, we were very successful in getting that funding um, from government, um, the co-funding with the ratepayer, but there was a timeline around that and it seems yeah. like there's been so many impediments to getting stuck in yeah. since we started with COVID and, and the you know, bank to bank um, rivers of water through the summer have just been incredible. Yep. Um, so, what's the kind of update on the timing of, of the project and the funding? Yeah, so you are correct. Look, river conditions over the last two months uh, have not been conducive uh, to removing gravel. So, we have let all those tranche two contracts, but contractors have simply not been able. Um, to get into those locations. So we'll, we'll be commencing discussions with Kanoa and the Crown around uh, our contract with them and about some of the, um, uh, I guess, conditions that we've had here locally in Hawke's Bay being the wettest six months ever on record. Uh, and though that does impact both uh, our earthworks projects in, with, with regards to stock banks and also the extraction of gravel. So we'll be having that discussion and just highlighting, um, you know, what's happened here to Kanawa with um, with a view to extending that program. Thank you. Any other questions? There are none. I'm happy to move, uh, receive and note uh, the report. Can I please have a second? Councillor Van Beek, all those who agree, say aye. Aye. Those against, carried. Thank you very much. Uh, we will head into uh, afternoon tea. Um, and then continue after our break. So we'll
50 mil for the week up there and quite a lot of um, on-farm infrastructure damage um, right across that range. Um, so probably, you know, more so than other events for that area in particular. But I think in general, um, you know, as an organisation, you know, we've been tested again and I think we should be proud of, um, you know, the um, flood protection that has been um, sort of offered and proven, you know, um, again, and, and protect our communities, I think, um, you know, it just kind of reminds us, you know, why we do um, that part of our core business. So um, well done to the <coughs> asset management team. Thank you. Neil? Uh, and similarly, following on um, uh, from Councillor Foley's comments, um, I, each of these events causes my place of work to be uh, very nervous because we are obliged to evacuate um, and we had significant issues potentially in front of us, but it was great to have um, such rapid and accurate reporting and information available. Uh, so pass those comments on to the yes. team uh, mm -hmm. that, um, that I, I felt a, a step change in, in the accessibility of information and uh, that certainly helps mm -hmm. um, the responsiveness going on. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for me, it simply um, continues to bring home the urgency and importance of um, of, of building our resilience, uh, particularly to flooding. Um, you've heard me on this before a hundred times, uh, but it, it, to me, it's our highest priority uh, in, in terms of protecting the community, as, as, as Will has said. Um, and I'll be interested to, to see when we when we review, look at your infrastructure review. Uh, and uh, we look to other strategic positioning uh, that we um, uh, that we look at opportunities to accelerate, um, double down on on that protection, the opportunities to do so. So congratulations to the team and uh, well done on this event. We're only one <laughs> shower away from um, uh, from from turning from a twenty to a fifty year and or a hundred years. So uh, it's not far away. Thank you. Councillor Harding. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through, through you, Chair, I just want to um, just pick up on the point about weeds, if I can. Chris, there's a lot of, been a lot of visible you know, weed in the Karamu system recently, and I just wanted my own understanding. Uh, to what extent is that driven by weed boating activity? Is that, a, or is that part of the intended system, or is this independent of weed boating? Um, so a lot of the blockages occurred in some of our smaller drains uh, where we don't uh, frequently weed boat. And that's, um, so we do weed boat in the Katamu uh, on purpose to remove that weed from the system. If we didn't remove that weed, we'd potentially have a collapse um, uh, and that, uh, that weed would be very problematic. Our current strategy is to cut it and let it go out to sea. Uh, sometimes it gets caught up uh, in various places uh, and sometimes we remove it if it's providing um, if it's offensive uh, near houses, etc. So in the last LTP, we did commit to investing in harvesting that weed. That's certainly the expectation of, um, I guess, the regulatory framework around that activity, and we had some money in the, in the LTP for that. So that's running a little bit behind. Um, there certainly is technology out there, um, and certainly by harvesting weed, it's very likely to also in increase the cost because you're adding extra activities, and then you've got to dry the weed out and dispose of it somewhere um, on land. So certainly on the Katamu, it's part of the intended um, practice. In some of the small drains, we simply can't get machines in there or we need high levels, to, high water levels to get machines in there. And so it's a combination um, of, of spraying, physically removing and weed cutting as part of that process. Any other questions or comments for Chris? Um, just to reiterate um, the appreciation of being kept in the loop uh, daily, almost, um, as things progress. Um, and it did give us confidence to know um, what the situation is and how it impacts our communities. So thank you very much for that, and long may it continue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Kia ora. Um, so back to uh, the item. Are there any questions for any of our staff regarding those significant activities? Yeah, yeah um, number 36, far, farm workshops on hill country erosion, a usual standard question for me, 
is it possible when those dates are available they can be shared with us as councillors when they're on so that actually we can uh, attend if, if need be um, just to, to hear what's being said and what's being done we'll, we'll definitely do that councillor i think the dates are in the paper as well um, yeah but they're not in my calendar oh, you want to carry on with what of course good as done <laughs> Councillor Harding. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Van Beek, for doing what I was <laughs> the, raising my point for me. So that was one of two points I wanted to raise about the uh, uh, about this particular report. Those um, hill country erosion. I think there's a lot of learning opportunity for councillors in, in attending those, and so I would that one in particular. I would I would certainly encourage management to uh, make it easy and encourage uh, councillors to attend. Uh, I'd be relaxed about whether those are uh, the internal an internal workshop or a um, one involving farmers, but that knowledge is, is valuable. Uh, and, and just a question: uh, at some stage, um, on a point fifty six catchment solutions project, it would mm -hmm. be nice to to have a, just a quick description about what that involves. Thank you. Very briefly, it's it, it's um, taking novel solutions to water quality problems and looking at how we can implement them at place with catchment. So this is actually something that the um, catchment group uh, applied for. We supported them and helped them with uh, that and Masia, uh, uh, the provider. But what I'd suggest is once that project has matured a little bit and we've learned some stuff, we could bring you back a little bit of insight. Thank you. Any other questions? There aren't any. Can I please have a mover and a second to receive? Thank you, Council Van Bank, Council Harding. All those in agree, say aye. Aye. Those against, carried. Thank you very much. Um, so we are into our uh, discussion, um, and it's a time to acknowledge um, our CEO, current CEO, who's with us till the 10th uh, of February. Um, but it is a chance for us to, to publicly, so in the public eye right now, um, <laughs> share the wonderful and, and wicked uh, things that they'd like to share about uh, James. But um, I know from my perspective, uh, you've led uh, this this council, the organisation, um, with such high integrity and empathy um, and such intelligence um, that uh, we will we will miss your character, your positivity. Um, and But we know that you've left us in good hands with the exec team. Um, and, you know, part of that is uh, Piri leading the team in the interim period. Um, so congratulations to you, Piri. Um, but this is not a goodbye um, in any shape or form. This is you moving on to the next stage. And um, if you need to be grounded in the metropolitan, we're here to help. Um, and we're also here to keep those connections alive. So um, just a big mahi to you. But we will celebrate more uh, on the 10th, Kilda. So I'll open it up. Maybe um, our longest uh, councillor mm -hmm. um, here. Uh, you can count how many terms on two hands, I'm not yeah. sure. <laughs> but um, I will pass it around the tepu uh, to be able to share your thoughts <coughs> um, and acknowledgements to James. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, I'd just like to firstly congratulate James on a tremendous appointment um, as a Secretary of the Environment. Um, uh, that, that, that really is achievement. It's a, it's a wonderful place for, for um, James to be, and um, uh, it's a reflection, I think, of the, um, if you like, the quality of service that we've had and enjoyed for the past six, six years, five years, perhaps nearly six years, um, uh, with James at the helm, and uh, we're extraordinarily blessed with that. The um, an outstanding chief executive, uh, he's led the organisation through a, a very um, substantial period of its growth, um, the complexity of issues that um, that have we've encountered over that period. Uh, have been um, superbly led by James and I don't think could have been led and dealt with uh, by anyone else um, in the sector, across the sector. So I think we've been very privileged to to have James uh, with us during that time. James and I go back quite a way, um, back to the 90s uh, where we served in parliamentary offices together mm -hmm. um, and right from the get-go when James was 
I think it was still in short pants <laughs> at that stage. Um, I'd just come through a parliamentary session myself uh, and we worked in the Minister's office together. Uh, but right from that point of time when first coming across James, um, he had stardom written right on his forehead um, <laughs> uh, because of his, his astute observations, analysis. Uh, he was um, uh, able to really distill um, matters so rapidly. Um, in our office, we're in awe of that, and uh, he certainly brought um, uh, a, a high degree of professionalism to uh, to that system. And he's progressed right through uh, the parliamentary process. Um, he's born to it. Uh, uh, he thrives in that environment. And um, I, 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 it's been a great privilege, James, to have been associated with you in that, uh, both at, a, if you like, a professional level and a personal level. Uh, it's been a privilege to be working with you. Um, uh, the, the, the ups and downs of that, the, um, uh, the emotions that go with it, and the entire, um, if you like, um, uh, issues that you face um, with, with such skill um, are to be commended. Uh, so we wish you um, farewell. I hope we don't. Um, I hope it's not the last we see of you. Uh, we inevitably will be knocking in your door, and I mentioned to you earlier that um, one of the things you bring to um, uh, policy making and direction of travel is, well, some sanity, really, uh, some uh, practical delivery. What does it mean uh, to implement these wonderful policies that our um, uh, the people in the Beltway think are pretty good for us and want to impose on us. At least we've got some counterweight to those often ridiculous and overwhelming um, policy decisions. At least we've got someone that appreciates um, what the consequences are and understands fully what it's like to deliver that on the ground and for those communities uh, that we serve. And I think this is something that... I don't need to go on too much longer. <laughs> This is something that, that is important, um, that, that to me has been missing in the past five years of this current government, is that uh, there seems to be a lack of appreciation of the consequences for policy uh, on communities. Um, and at least we've got someone that can um, put the hand up and say, no, that's not going to work, or let's do it a different way. So congratulations, James. Um, you're a credit to... Uh, this community and you'll be a credit uh, to New Zealand as a whole and we're very pleased to see you take on one of the most critical roles uh, for the next decade. The other speakers? I mean, there's nothing for we left to say. <laughs> but I, I, I concur and, and while it's a great loss to me as a new councillor, um, you know, it's not about me, it's about you, James. So, um, and, you know, coming from another council where it's, um, you're often spoken about um, as being the person that really understands exactly what Neil is describing, the, um, the consequences and impact of the policies that come down from central government, I think that we are incredibly lucky that you'll be there to be guiding that. So while it's um, a loss here, probably in the, uh, long term is going to be a huge advantage to us, uh, all regional, all councils, but particularly to us because you understand this region so well. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the small amount of time I've uh, got to, had to watch you work really and uh, understand a little bit more of your work here. My turn. So, um, firstly, uh, Councillor Curtin, um, I, you summed it up so much better than I, ever I could. Uh, what slightly worries me and uh, what Councillor Curtin would have to say is that, is that I would hate the full burden of, of, of all the uh, myriad of policies <laughs> that, that affect our, our community to, to fall upon your shoulders. I think we have to be, we have to be optimistic but realistic uh, about... Uh, about the extent to which you can um, bring your enormous talents to bear on, on making things better. But but we know um, that we couldn't have a better person there. 
doing that with, with better experience. I just want to say that uh, mm-hmm. for me personally, uh, my journey with James seems to have been a lot more than five years. So it was maybe six or seven. Uh, first connected with James, uh, I think in your general manager strategy and policy or something like that, just uh, pre, pre the CE role. And, and uh, one of James's big jobs at that stage was to uh, come in and, and make sense of off tank. And he did that very well and effectively, and uh, he was, you know, uh, instrumental, you know, at least in part, in um, in getting us on track and, and and getting us into delivery mode there. So, I thank you for that. Uh, personally, also, um, James, you've been part of my my journey from uh, an industry advocate to to now sitting here with a little bit of a sojourn on staff as well. And uh, I did come and talk to you personally about. Uh, about my, you know, driving interest in being part of the solution for tank and, and on the delivery side of things. And look, I, I, I personally appreciate the encouragement that you've given me to do that. I hope that you don't regret that now, or you haven't lived to regret that. But I, I certainly have, have valued that. And um, you know, if I get the opportunity to uh, ever get your guidance again, I'll certainly be seeking it. So, thank you personally. He kia tātou. Uh, ko ki ngā whakaaro ki tau a hakoa tika tonu. Uh, tika tonu atu ki a koe e hemu. E, e he i, I ki a tōhiki. E hiki roa tōhiki. Mm-hmm. E tama. Te ua ua nā e tama te maroro. I nā hoki rā. Te to hewa te ua ua nā e tau nei. O rera hoki aku mahara i te wā i ngā Inga hui, inga tau patu patu, uh, i aua wāra i ora tonu o kukau mātua, engari kua ngaro atu rātou i naiani. Uh, kua hau mai, me ki te rama ki au, uh, ki te whai atu i a koe, me te ki atu ki a koe, me whakatīnana tonu koe i o kupu. Uh, nō reira, ahakoa ko piki taumata koe ki tērā o te, te mana tū mo te, mo te tai ao. Uh, tēnei āhau uh, e tiro whakaaro nui ana uh, ki a koe me o mahi. Uh, me te whakamuhio atu, whakamaumahara i a koe, kai te tū koe ki runga i ngā pohiwi o te ao kohatu. Nō reira, e tahi wā, he hoa riri koe, Kia mātou o ngā hapu karanga o Mangaro Korangata. E tahi wā, he hoa tata, e arahi ana i a mātou. O reira, tenei ka mihi atu ki a koe. Uh, so just, just briefly, um, James, I, I referenced uh, the haka chika tonu, and I guess some of, some of the gold nuggets of... Mm-hmm of guidance that it was initially designed for, composed for, is to to remind those that are moving on to perhaps greener pastures, that it might be an opportunity um, to reiterate that, uh, you know, me hoki mai koe, me hoki mai koe ki te matau a Māori kia puri ai, ngā hau o tāwhiri mātia, it's important that uh, that you are reminded that there is always an opportunity to return to our region, to Aurohe, so that you can be cleansed by the wounds of our moment. Um, Loreira, tēnei ka mihi atu ki a koe. Sometimes you were, <coughs> you were on the very opposite side of the debate uh, for our hapu of uh, Bridge Pa, and uh, it's a gentle reminder to say, that um, with all the efforts of your of your leadership to be able to, I guess close close the gap, close the gap of um, of understanding, um, there's a lot more work to do, and with your elevation into into the role uh, with the Ministry for Environment, uh, rest assured that Ngati uh, Rahunga Itarangi, Ngati Poporo. Uh, we'll be keeping a watchful eye on you 
um, not just to hold you, not, not, not for the sake of accountability, but where we can support. Torera, tenei ka mihi atu ki a tātou. Kia ora. <laughs> Kia ora, James. Look, uh, I've been around the table five minutes too, and um, I uh, endorse wholeheartedly everything that's been said to date. Um, the only thing I can think of to add to that is that if you're sitting in, in this position, and indeed the position of the staff too, the, the overwhelming impression I have in the brief time I've had with you is the uh, respect for and confidence in uh, the opinions and guidance that you provide us. And I think as far as we are concerned, that's sort of one of the most important things you can get from someone in your position. And I think as far as the staff are concerned, then it's a privilege to have someone like you to lead the organisation because in doing so you pass on a lot to us and we are the better for it. So thank you. Kapai. Good. I'm going to take a different tack. In 2003, as a uh, money boot uh, orchard manager and orchard owner, I flew to Wellington and there was this chappy in the front with a brown long coat. And I asked a couple of Gary Jones and a few people around me, who's that over there? Oh, you'll see a lot of him, you'll see a lot of him. Anyway, <laughs> I then um, took on a, a contract for 14 years with Horticulture New Zealand in Wellington. And just about every flight, there you were, you know. And, um, and you've been called astute already today. Um, but that wasn't that astute, doing that much travel by plane. But I can't believe it that you're actually going back there again. <laughs> <laughs> all this climate change talk and what we need to do and you're going back there again. But um, I found out you're actually a lover of cats, uh, the Jaguar type. Uh, is it six, eight or 12 or even more cylinders? I'm not sure. So maybe, you know, under the, that black coat, that long black coat, there are actually some, some secrets that not everybody knows about. Um, I must say that um, James, and it's already been said by, by Neil as well, I'm 100% sure where this council has got to up this point where we're a leader in, in many fronts um, and I'm uh, uh, just, you know, um, uh, coastal hazards and so forth. We're leading um, uh, way ahead of other councils and that's not because of the, the people that have sat around here as governors, except for maybe Neil, um, <laughs> but it's really became because of your leadership and there's no two ways about it. You know, um, I heard uh, Rick um, say once or twice even that um, Phil Twyford hate you on speed dial. Um, you are an influencer, and uh, and we have noticed that. And uh, we hope, uh, and I personally hope, that the appointment that you've taken on, uh, you know very well with your capability, what you're able to do there. You're a very clear thinker, uh, very neutral. I've never really seen you either left or right moving, but actually what needs to be done will get done. And so uh, I'm really pleased that um, you actually have taken that role. Um, you run out of uh, out of uh, really your steam here. You've done everything you could do, I would say, and it would be an absolute waste of a star pupil like yourself to continue to stay here. And we really mm -hmm. hope that you will, in Wellington, make some real sense because I've been there with, with Immigration Department of Labour, M MSD. Um, they do need common sense. And uh, you've been here in, in, in the regions. You've seen uh, our hurt, um, especially from our, from our rural sector, and I hope that you are able to bring some sense. So that's uh, the wish I have got for you in the future. And thanks for the last three years. This is getting more and more difficult as to go around. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, James, for your time and for your um, the confidence that you bring to to be new new to the table. And it's been it's really very reassuring to have you know to have your steady hand, and we will miss that. And, you know, I, I definitely do hold dear that you will take those, um, the the realities of of theory with you to Wellington and how it hits the ground and what impacts those theoretical decisions um, have on but back on the land. So go well, good luck. Yeah, cheers, um, James. Uh, yeah, I like um, Thompson's idea. Tika <laughs> Tony. Yeah, so be true to yourself and, and of course to the to the co-pop of the tail. Um, I, I, 
I um, have listened to you quite a bit. You, you've um, made a quick assessment. You uh, give a complete and almost bloody parrot fashion of what's uh, required for their rules and responsibilities are. You, you know the rule inside out. And um, oh, I'm, I'm really thankful for that because uh, we can get an answer from you straight away on, on just about any subject in, in here, so um, James. Um, and I think that minister, can, he saw that straight away when he talked to you, so... I think that they're, they're getting a better deal out of this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm grateful that though, actually Rick, when he took us down to Parliament, um, yeah, I don't know why you picked going back down there either. But <laughs> 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 a bit of a rabbit warren or, or a beehive, whatever you think you pick. Uh, but um, yeah, you, you, you will be good for our country, um, um, James. You're good for our district. You're good for the country. So yeah, thanks for the service. So just in addition to everything that's been said, I'll try to keep this brief, but um, one thing I wanted to highlight, James, was your commitment to the job, which no one could fault, um, which also turns into a sacrifice um, just because of the, the, the time and energy you'd put into it. Um, and I remember I was a pretty new um, councillor three years ago. It was Christmas Day 2019, and suddenly you're getting ready for lunch and the phone pings. Uh, it's a flipping council email. I thought, what could this be? And it was James. <laughs> and I just had a look to just make sure I was, my, my memory was correct. And he starts off and he goes, uh, to all the councillors, hope you're all having a good day. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't go into what was wrong, but <laughs> wouldn't be appropriate. But, um, but you know, that was just a sign that um, it didn't matter what day of the year, um, time of the day, you know, you're always there to answer your phone or emailing us with updates. So, you know, and that comes at a cost to your family. So, um, you know, I'd like to acknowledge that and, um, you know, thank, thank you and your family for, for that commitment to the role. Uh, one thing um, I'll miss that um, got very used to over the years is sit here in the debate going, just going around the table and I just couldn't work out which way I'd go or land and, and then you'd always pipe in at the end and, and add your piece and, I'd, and it would just make everything become so clear to me and, and, I'll, and, and, and so I really miss that, although I'm sure Petty will step up and, and, um, and follow your footsteps. But, um, you know, it's, it's um, huge shoes to fill and um, probably the, the most impressive part for me and I'm sure to all the... Um, the exec team and, 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 and the rest of the staff was your ability to be over everything. And so that's going to be um, extremely hard to, to replicate, I'm sure. It's just, um, yeah, it's certainly not something that's um, required because that's why we have specialists in, in, in each of our departments, but your ability to be over everything was um, truly impressive. So um, thank you for the last three years for me as well, and um, good luck. Um, down in Wellington and, and um, hope it all goes well. I'll say a few words. Um, look, thank you so much uh, for the very kind and generous words. Uh, I, I did want to start with an apology uh, and, and as su such as by nature I can't help but think of all of the unfinished business uh, and the things that I thought probably five years ago uh, that we might have made more progress on than we haven't. So I'll probably just keep um, uh, sort of uh, self-flagellating for the remainder of my career <laughs> about the, the, the things that weren't achieved. But look, that's <laughs> just kind of, you know, um, uh, if, if you don't have, you know, aspiration and ambition in these, these roles, then you won't strive to uh, get more done and push the boundaries and that sort of thing. So I think it is a, um, it's an essential uh, character attribute of your next chief executive, any chief executive that you appoint, uh, is that, you know, they always want to uh, achieve more and, and deliver more. Uh, and I've just been enormously uh, fortunate to have been so well supported during my time uh, by the councillors uh, that I've uh, had the pleasure of, of serving. Uh, I've had um, their trust and confidence, your trust and confidence to get on and do the job. Uh, we've been supported uh, enormously with, uh, with resources, with mandate, uh, with backing during tough decisions and difficult times. Uh, particularly during those COVID times when uh, council very much just swung in behind and supported 
uh, uh, me and the, the leadership team in, in, in running the organisation uh, in the way that we, we, we had to. So um, don't take that for granted. Uh, I've just been really fortunate to have uh, that support from you all. Uh, I've also been enormously fortunate to be so well supported by uh, such a talented team. Um, the executive team uh, from right from the start, um, you know, I inherited uh, a strong team and was able to make some great appointments along the way. And so I've been uh, enormously well supported by them and by the wider organisation. So uh, it's all their hard work that makes me kind of look good. Uh, so I want to acknowledge the, um, the huge amount of effort that, that they've put in behind an ambitious programme of work uh, in support of, of council. So, uh, so that's been a real, real tailwind. This role has uh, been the stepping stone to my next role. Uh, I'm pretty clear that I wouldn't have been appointed as the Secretary for the Environment had I not had this experience working uh, in our local government. And one of the things that, that attracted me to apply for the role when I initially spoke to the Public Service Commission about uh, the possibility of applying was their real interest in having that real world on the ground experience in local government coming back to the centre and informing the next phase of the Ministry for the Environment's work, which is going to be all about implementing a new resource management system. So um, that aligns very nicely, obviously, with kind of, you know, my career journey. Uh, as Neil has described, it's kind of gone full circle in many respects. Uh, and, and, and the privilege I've had of serving this council and serving the region has been kind of instrumental in, in giving me the experiences and skills to now take back into the centre and do my best to try and um, uh, influence the, the very, very large policy machinery that is um, the Wellington Public Service to be uh, attuned and attentive to the needs of our communities uh, and ensure that what we're doing is practical, achievable and get some real world outcomes. So, uh, so with that, uh, I just really wanted to um, uh, close by thanking you all um, collectively and individually uh, for your support and for the, the privilege and the opportunity of being able to serve this council. Thank you, James. I think we'd all agree that uh, we we accept your thank you to us and throw back a thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Well, um, we will move on with our last item, um, and to do that, we will have to go into public excluded. Uh, so, can I please have a mover and a seconder? So move. Thank you. Move. And seconded by Councillor Curden. Those yeah. who agree, say aye. Aye. Those against, carry. Thank you.